I'm John Golia. And I'm Greg Fife. And we are the, the Flight, Flight Safety, Safety Detectives. Detectives. We're just two guys who have spent most of their career with the National Transportation Safety Board investigating aircraft disasters and aviation safety issues all over the world. Yep, and this podcast is where we talk about everything from accidents, airplane technology, to the big business of aviation. We live and breathe aviation. My co-host, John, has been in the aviation business for more than 60 years. He was the first and only airframe and power plant mechanic to get a presidential appointment to the National Transportation Safety Board. And Greg is a former air safety investigator and go team captain for the NTSB. He's investigated everything that flies worldwide since he started his career 40 years ago. And on top of that, he is a living legend of aviation inductee. So between John and myself, we have over 100 years of aviation safety experience. It's time to buckle up because it's going to be wheels up. Let's get this show in the air. Well, John, it is another day of stay at home. Except I'm not staying at home. I actually uh, came up to the office today because I decided I needed a little change of scenery. So I'm looking out on the ramp. I actually see three airplanes. So it's nice to see that at least business aviation charter is uh, coming back. So maybe that's a positive sign. So I know that we have been doing our flight safety detective podcast from our respective homes and of course, respecting the social distancing. Unfortunately, it's been about 1,400 plus miles between you and me. So hope you're doing well. All is well here. I'm locked up, staying away from everybody still. It doesn't look like we're going to be unlocked tomorrow. Tomorrow's the last day of the official uh, lockdown. I suspect they're going to announce it today that it's going to continue. We had even more new cases this week. So it's uh, we haven't peaked yet here in Massachusetts. Well, it's a it's a gorgeous day here in Colorado. It's supposed to be up in the seventies. Uh, the snow capped mountains look beautiful. So it was definitely worth getting out and actually coming to work and earning <laughs> and earning a living. So in the news, of course, uh, over the past couple of months, the airlines uh, have really taken just a huge hit, and business aviation slash charter is also down a lot of the airplanes are, have been sitting on the ground and, and of course i mean general aviation and flight training and, and some of the small airplane operations too have also uh, taken a big hit as far as uh, keeping the airplanes on the ground i mean we have now a surplus of jet a and i would expect that we probably have a surplus of 100 lowlet as well which really shows that uh, flying has tanked, pardon the pun. It is one of those concerns where when you have airplanes sitting on the ground and you have them there for a long period of time, like the airlines have done, not only with the MAX when that issue started, but now with all the airplanes that are parked because uh, they've cut back on schedules and they're retiring these airplanes, the big question is how do not only the airlines, but just People that own an airplane or operate an airplane or helicopter, how do they keep them in a flyable condition if they aren't going to go park them out in the desert and they're going to be sitting there forever? How do you keep these airplanes in flyable storage? And, and John, you and I have had these discussions because our concerns with at least the 737 MAX was the fact that when they do return that airplane to service, did the airlines around the world that operate those airplanes, did they properly put those aircraft in flyable storage so that they don't have problems when the airplanes are then returned to service? And I think that this coronavirus sitting a lot of airplanes on the ground, again, raises now the concern amongst all aircraft, not just the 737 MAX. Yes. Well, we had a, quite an education from at Boeing and from General Electric while we were out there about what they need to do to keep these airplanes in an airworthy condition. And now the airlines are going to put that into practice themselves on the rest of their fleet. You know, I read where Delta has something around 600 airplanes parked around the country. In fact, I saw some of them flying over uh, uh, Birmingham, Alabama. They were lined up, quite a few of them all lined up. And in uh, Pittsburgh, I recently saw some pictures of Pittsburgh where the uh, airliners were all lined up. And I was also recently up to Hanscom Field and NetJets has a whole bunch of airplanes lined up there 
just parked. So this, so the uh, corporate airplanes are also the jet powered corporate airplanes are also lined up everywhere. And there's well, with very that, little flying. With that being said, we've had the opportunity to talk to a variety of people over the last uh, several months on the podcasts when we talk about you know maintenance, maintenance issues, things like that. And I know that you had an oppor- talk, uh, opportunity to talk to one of uh, your friends and colleagues about the pickling, if you will. That's the the term that we use in aviation for uh, putting the airplane into some level of storage because it's sitting on the ground. And the one thing airplanes and helicopters and anything else that, that flies, those machines hate to sit. They were built to fly. They were meant to fly. And kind of like your car, when you leave it parked forever, stuff starts to break. And it's amazing how, you know, you think about, I parked the airplane. It's not doing anything. How could this break? Well, parts, component parts, seals, uh, a variety of different other things in an aircraft, they start to dry out. We accumulate bugs uh, getting into pedo tubes because the airplanes are sitting, bees, birds, everything else. So I think with our podcast today, John, based on what we were talking about previously, we decided that it was one of those topics that we should bring up for the aviation public, but primarily for the owners and the operators on how do an airline or a net jets or anybody else that has to park airplanes for a long time, what do they need to do to ensure that their aircraft are kept in a flyable condition? And we also have today with us a returning guest, a good friend of mine and, and colleague, Jason Lacassic. Jason worked for both a engine manufacturer, piston engine manufacturer, as an air safety investigator, also worked for the FAA, has a lot of experience on the maintenance side of the house. So we decided to have Jason back on the show today to talk about what general aviation airplane and helicopter pilots who are flying, you know, a Cessna 172 or have a, a beach bonanza or something else. If they aren't flying the airplane because uh, they've respected the stay-at-home order, what is it that they should be doing with their particular airplane? And then, of course, what is it that they need to do when they decide that they are ready to fly? Some of the things that they need to be looking for before they crank that engine and, and head out into the wild blue. So welcome today, Jason. We appreciate you being back on the show with us. Thank you, gentlemen. I sure appreciate the opportunity, and thanks for having me back. Well, since John is the maintenance guru, I'm going to let him just pick your brain with regard to uh, what general aviation pilots, the owner-operator pilot, should be looking for what they need to do uh, right now with their aircraft, but then what they should be doing when they personally return their aircraft to service. So, Jason... You know, many GA airplanes sit for weeks and sometimes many weeks on end without being used. So why don't we start this with just in general, what should a pilot or an owner do with his airplane? He just finished flying it for an hour and a half. He's putting it down. He's not going to come back to it for two weeks. Is there anything special he should be doing to that airplane to leave it sitting there for two weeks? No, two two weeks is pretty much the threshold. Now, you know, we kind of need to preface this, John. We'll start not with every single manufacturer and every single engine uh, producer out there has different instructions in all of their literature and maintenance manuals. So every, every one of them has a different thing. But I think it's pretty safe to say up front that talking about all of the piston engine guys, I, I think for, the, for a two-week period, you're pretty safe for just letting it go for two weeks. What would be the time frame for you before you would start to take some precautions? So really for me, the, the precautions really start when you look at the literature and you get into it. And as Greg mentioned earlier, I, you know, I used to work for a piston engine manufacturer. And uh, so most of the data and most of the material that you look at starts at about the 30 day period. So most of the manufacturers have, you know, starting at 30 days. If it's going to be inactive or not in service, you need to really start thinking about the preservation because, as, as you know, is one of the major things that owners and operators fight is internal corrosion. That's one of the things. And the easiest way for you to prevent internal corrosion is to apply lubrication, to have it coated. And longer that the inside of the engine sits and the oil 
isn't splashed and sprayed inside to try to offset that corrosion that, that's continuously trying to attach and adhere to parts in the engine. It's a timetable that the engine begins to, for the lack of a better term, kind of dry out and you, you don't get that lubrication. So if you start off with, a, you know, Lycoming has a recommendation at 30 days. You know, they have a service letter. They have service literature out there for you, L180B. And Continental Motors, Teledyne Continental Motors, they have a service manual, a maintenance manual, you know, standard practices for spark plug ignition engines. That's publication M0. And then there's other literature, you know, for Franklin Engines has their own. Rotax Bombardier has their own. Pratt & Whitney, you know, 985s, people that fly Beavers and Otters, and you know, and, and up to big piston engines. They, you know, they each all have their own individual instructions. But I think for this conversation, if we just kind of stick with the generality of, of the small 172 guy, you know, the, the, the Lycoming and the Continental guys, you know, there's kind of a process that you start at. And if you determine that you think that, you know, COVID-19 is going to affect you and you, you're going to have to stay at home and you're going to go past that 30 day mark, then it's kind of important to, to grab one of those pieces of service literature and to kind of review it and to see if you can do it. Before we kind of get into that and talk about the generality, I just thought I'd bring up with you guys. I noticed there's a, there's a, there's actually a problem out in the market right now, uh, specifically for preservative oils. Continental Motors, about a week and a half ago, it might have been two weeks ago, it was on the April 13th of this year, Continental Motors put out a service bulletin. So it's service bulletin 20-03. They've had a lot of telephone calls, a technical customer support there that Everybody in the country has basically run out of preservative oil that you use to do the preservation of the engines. So Continental created a service bulletin to kind of give some alternate instructions, you know, an, an alternate method of compliance for uh, doing the preventative portion of the engine. With that, you kind of want to just kind of talk about the, the process of what you would do at the 30-day mark if you're going to say it's a 60 days. Yeah, one of the things, Jason, that we've discussed and, and both you and I have experienced in an airplane that we were working on recently was John asked a question about what pilots, what you would do when you, you finished a flight, you know you're going to leave the airplane parked. Now, I've experienced friends of mine who, even with the airplane hangered, they will typically open up the oil cap to allow steam to vent through the oil cap so that they don't build up condensation as the engine cools down and, of course, accumulate water in the oil system. Others, you know, John and I have talked about, you know, well, it's got a vent tube, the, the moisture will vent out of that. Is there a technique that general aviation pilots, when you park the airplane, whether you park it just overnight or or for two weeks, is it a good idea to open up the oil cap and, and let that steam vent so that it doesn't accumulate moisture in the oil? You know, exactly from what you kind of just mentioned there, Greg. Yeah, it wasn't long ago. It was, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, you know, I, we were looking at returning a, an aircraft to service and, and getting it flying after, a you know, an 18-month hiatus of sitting on the ground in an extremely humid environment. You know, draining the oil, we found evidence of a lot of moisture, a lot of water. And, and talking about the cap, specifically in this one airplane that we were looking at, you know, when you pulled the cap off, there was corrosion on the inside of the cap and the components and the, and the filler neck that was there. So that seems to be a collection point for moisture afterwards. And, and had that one, the, the specific engine that we were looking at, had the, uh, had the cap been opened up and vented, that moisture would have gone out. Now, the engines do have breather lines. But not all of the moisture gets out of the engine through the breather lines. So that is a that that would be a good thing to remember, just as long as you remember when you come back to put the cap back on. You know, leaving the door open, remove for flight flag, some sort of note, tape sticky that remembers you so somebody just doesn't come back. So, you know, if you have a partner with the airplane, he knows that you took the cap off and just doesn't jump in it and go and you have an issue. Hopefully they're doing a pre-flight, Jason, so that doesn't happen. But, you know, we're in the business of acts investigation and the three of us have seen people that basically kick the tires, light the fire and let's rock and roll and, and they don't do the proverbial pre-flight. And that's, we kind of want to be prepared for that as well, just so everybody has the information. You know, condensation requires a uh, pretty confined containment. So if you have a breather tube and you have the, the oil filler cap open, then as the temperature changes, there'll be airflow through there. And the airflow is actually a, an item that diminishes condensation. So that makes a lot of sense not to just to lose, leave the cap loose, but to actually take it right off. 
Absolutely, John. And what, and what Greg and I saw in this one particular engine that we were working with, it is sitting in a very humid environment inside of a hangar, though, for 18 months. And it was absolutely amazing the amount of water that came out of it when, it, when we drained the sump, when we were changing the oil. And we actually flushed the engine with uh, quite a few quarts of oil after that as well. So, you know, and then we're going to do another oil change. We actually had evidence of uh, uh, quite a bit of water build up inside of this particular engine. And, and nobody had done any sort of, you know, nobody had opened it up. Nobody had vented the, the oil filler neck or any of those things, which would have definitively helped with that problem. But they didn't. So, you know, we were stuck with the result. We've all known about how fuel tanks make water, especially if you're using uh, Jet A. They seem to attract all the water. And that's partially because they they have a vent, but they don't have airflow. And it it allows it to condense whatever moisture is in the air in the tank at the time. And it's then replaced by whatever air is out there and the moisture in the air that's out there again and again and again. So I've been in many tanks where I've been amazed at how much water is in the bottom of the tank. Airflow is a good friend there. All right, you talked about preservative oil. I've seen it. That you know, I understand it. It's different than that engine oil. It doesn't flow as easily. It's much stickier. So when you get it into your system, it sort of stays on the cam uh, lobes. It stays in the journals. It stays on the on the lifters. All the things that you want to protect, if they're coated with this preventative type oil, it can help diminish rust, which is also something you see. And an engine that's left around where there is moisture and the lifters get all uh, rusty. The cam lobes where, where they're just sitting there can become all rusty. Even portions of the crankshaft can become rusty. It, it's a problem. So if people are going to leave their airplane for a while, it needs to be taken care of. And, and I actually have a friend of mine that's had his airplane sitting idle for over two years uh, he's just now thinking about flying, and I'm telling him you better get somebody to do a boroscope on your engine, tear it down, take a good look at the insides before you go trust your life to it. Absolutely, and that that's a really good recommendation. And and you know, John, what you were talking about there about how it sticks, you, you know, the procedures just kind of in, in general when you do this and you know that it is, you know, you're going to do your standard oil change. You're going to change an oil filter if you have one. If not, you don't use one. You change the oil, you drain it out, you put in the preservative oil. Now again. Different manufacturers have different recommendations. Lycoming likes you to do a percentage of preservative and a percentage of mineral. Continental is straight mineral. Or in this. So there's different manufacturers have different recommendations, whether you put just straight preservative oil in or you do a blend of mineral oil and preservative oils. There's different things that you look at. But with that all said, once you put the oil into the recommendation and you fill it up to the level that it is, you know, you take it out, you run it up, you bring it up to a, a minimum of 165 degrees. Some manufacturers like you taking it up to no more than 200, but they like you to run it for quite a bit of time. So that way, anything, any potential humidity, any sort of water, anything that could be in the preservative oil that you put in or anything residual left in the engine, you've now gotten it all out of there. Back to something John had said. When we boroscoped the engine we were working on, did we see uh, rust on the cam and on that crankshaft? No, we didn't get to, we didn't get down to that part. When you and I you, you and I did it, we only had some small residual surface rust at the top uh, portion of the cylinder bores. So above the piston, so where the pistons are. So going back to operation, you know, when an engine is shut off. You don't know where inside of the engine where everything stopped. So crankshaft to camshaft timing. So we don't know by looking at the outside which cylinders have valves that are open, which ones are closed, which ones are both closed. We don't know where in the cycle we're at. But for the most part, most of the cylinders have valves that are open. So with that, that, you know, coming up through the exhaust, that humidity again travels right up through the exhaust, gets right into some, if it's an exhaust valve, or if the intake's open through the intake, humidity gets in, and you get that corrosion buildup in the liner. So what you and I observed was when I took the bore scope in there and I shot all those images at the top, our corrosion was, you know, less than we had, we had small corrosion on the bottom of the cylinder bores within a half an inch of the top of top dead center. So it was very close to the top and we didn't have anything down the center line part of it so with that being said that's why it's so important that as you and john were talking especially with his friend who's got an airplane that's been sitting for two years 
it is vitally important that you don't just stick the boroscope in the cylinder and go, ah, it's, it's not bad, it's, it looks okay. You really have to do a very detailed examination to see if there's corrosion hiding in a variety of different places that could potentially create issues once you get the airplane back in the air. Absolutely. As one of the standard practices doing the preservative process, if you're going to be longer than 30 days, is what you do is to just for the problem that we were talking about, you remove all the top spark plugs and you use the same preservative oil if you're using a mix or just the straight preservative oil and you use a spray gun and you spray, you know, a certain amount. Some manufacturers tell you up to two ounces. They want you to actually put in the cylinder bore. And then what you do is, is because of you don't, where, where the engine is stopped, the pistons are all at different levels inside of the cylinders. So you put oil in and then you turn it over by hand, you know, half a dozen, a dozen times. You're, you're moving that oil around and then you spray in a little more oil just to make sure that everything is absolutely coated. And then once you do that, you have an option. If you have incandescent plugs, the moisture wicking spark plugs that uh, normally go out with engines when they're shipped new or you buy a set, you would want to put those in. So those help draw some of that moisture out. But if you don't have those, you just reinstall your original spark plugs and, and that will seal it up as well. But in order to go that one last step, now we put the preservative oil in and we want to stop anything else getting in. The engine is still warm. We've run it up. We want to stop. The, the, one of the key things for real preservation is, is you know drawing wicking that moisture out is using inc incandescent bags and there's all kinds of different you can either make your own you could buy incandescent you know desiccant crystals yourself you can make bags with little flyers and stringers on them nobody really tells you you know that you have to go out and buy them but you can make them yourself and if you put them in the exhaust so if you make one that goes a plug up in your exhaust or your multiple exhaust ports and you make one that goes over the intake or one that comes out the breather line you know every engine is kind of set up a little different they have some similar features but they're set up a little differently so for your application you would want to kind of pick everywhere where air can directly enter the engine and, and create a little desiccant bag part of it so with the preservative oil filling up the cylinders adding the desiccant plugs putting the desiccant up into the open ports you've pretty much sealed the engine and you, you wick away any additional moisture that's in there. That's overall a, a very good general practice for preservation. And that's why it's so important that, you know, your mechanic definitely follows the manufacturer's recommended practices and, and techniques. We're just giving a general overview, but it is vitally important that the mechanic does what the engine manufacturer at least recommends so that it is done properly for that specific engine. That's you're absolutely right, Greg, because in some of the piston, you know, it's it's really funny. I have a friend, I have a couple of friends that are running Rotaxes now, and uh, Rotaxes are becoming very popular for their power to weight ratio. But, you know, we've had, a, him and I had a conversation, it was probably about six or seven months ago we were talking about it. And in Rotax, you have to read, I, I haven't been able to read Rotax's manuals for the 912 and the 914s, but they actually have a procedure in there where they go against what you're traditionally taught about not going out and turning over the propeller. Because normally like a Continental, a Lycoming, a Franklin, a Pratt Whitney. Once you've preserved it, you preserve it and you want that oil to stick, okay? Because everything inside of the engine is lubricated with splash spray and vapor, if you will. But in a Rotax, the way that a Rotax works, Rotax actually wants you to go out and turn the propeller by hand and it actually pressurizes the system and moves oil through the system. So, you know, again, Back to the manufacturer's recommendations, you, you kind of need to follow what your manufacturer recommends, and Rotax recommends people go out and turn it over by hand. And as far as those moisture-absorbing bags, instead of making them, I was recently in Home Depot, and they have quite a selection from small ones to quite large ones for home use. And those certainly can be hung right there under the cowling of the engine, near the exhaust stacks or near the breather for the engine. And keep track of them. They, they certainly draw an awful lot of moisture out of the air. So if you can keep the cowling on and keep it contained, uh, that'll prevent a lot of moisture from even starting to get into the engine. Absolutely, John. You're right on. And if you go into the M0 publication for Continental Aerospace Technologies, now Continental Motors, and you go to their preservation part of Chapter 9 in their book, they actually have a section in there where they have a checklist. They actually have a checklist for you now, kind of like what you would do, like a 100-hour annual inspection checklist. They have a checklist that you can print out that actually walks you through 15 days, 30 days, 45 days, 60 days. You know, it gets you checked time 
signature. They actually have a check sheet all the way out to 90 days for you going out and checking the engine, looking at the desiccants and all that stuff. It's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of an interesting little uh, check guide for anybody that needs one. And you can use it for any engine. Yes, as long as you do what the manufacturer calls out for their engine, you can do anything above that that you would like. Absolutely. And then moving beyond the engine, of course, it's the airframe that we're also concerned about. Airplanes sit, if they're outside, they're exposed to more elements, not only the weather, but of course, birds, bees, bugs, all sorts of little critters that want to find a place to build a nest or build a hive and that kind of stuff. So what kind of preventative actions should we be looking at for those airplanes that are sitting outside and then we'll move into the hangar? Yeah, absolutely. For, you know, for me, Greg, looking around, you know, one of the things that I've always looked for, and it was actually amazing how many times we found this on site and doing investigation stuff, are mud daubers and wasp nests. I have found so many mud daubers and wasp nests. That one's really important. They get into really small spaces and cracks and things. And so in my personal experience, I I found quite a few of those bird's nests. You know, you you go out to the scene, you take the top cowling off, and the whole top of the engine's covered with a bird's nest. You know, they probably didn't do a pretty good pre-flight. And even if you have a pitot tube cover on, that's not necessarily going to prevent the little critters from getting into that pitot tube. I mean, they'll find a way, just like they find a way in your house, to work their way into that pitot tube cover and into the pitot tube itself to build a, a nest or, you know, whatever it is they're building. And a lot of people pull the pitot tube cover off and figure, hey, we're good to go. And in fact, that's not necessarily the case. And uh, and then they find out the hard way as they're blasting down the runway, they don't have any airspeed. So it, it is those nooks and crannies and crevices. I had a bird's nest built in very short period of time in an airplane that I owned. It was sitting outside because I, I had lost my hangar. And within two weeks of that airplane sitting outside, there was a bird's nest. Well, it was built in the back of the engine where when I looked at the engine cowling when I was checking the oil i didn't see that bird's nest and i took off in maryland i was taken off into uh, an overcast i got into the overcast and apparently where that nest was was close to an exhaust stack because i smelled something burning and if you want to get your heart started i'll tell you what it's one thing to go blasting into the clouds at 700 feet and then all of a sudden start smelling something like it's burning And you're trying to figure out, well, you know, I'm not going to be able to put this airplane down like right now. I mean, I have to try and either fly an approach or come back or tell ATC to get me on the ground, you know, somewhere BFR. And I'll tell you, it's it's the last thing you want to do is find out you have something like that in the aircraft or in the engine compartment when you're in the worst possible circumstance. And in this case, it was IFR conditions. So it is one of those things. How about flight controls? You know, we talk about the fact that a lot of the flight controls are not necessarily torque tubes or push tubes, but in fact, they're cables. Is there anything that we have to be concerned with in looking at cables, cable pulleys and bell cranks and that kind of stuff? Are the cables going to stretch? Are they going to shrink? What What is there to look at if we're going to have the airplane on the ground for a long period of time? Well, certainly, it, certainly the coatings on the cables need to be controlled. Some people or some manufacturers call out to grease the cables. Others do not. Many cables are stainless steel, but it's also the quality of the stainless steel. They're certainly not 304, which is surgical grade in the stainless, because I can recall many, many inspections where we've done on cables and, and, and there's rust inside them. You find rust. And you also find when you run your hand over it and not pay attention and have a rag with it, you also find out that there's little strands sticking out that, that like to do a job on your hands. They get your attention as well. So, yes, you need to be concerned about your cables, especially the ones that are outside that are close to being exposed to the weather. And if the airplane is outside and the, and the rain and the wind and the rest of it, they're going to get wet. I don't care what you do, they're going to get wet, and it needs to be a concern. I keep telling people, and not everybody listens, that, that after you leave an airplane parked for a while, and I don't mean a week or a month, but if you're out there for six months or more, you really need to do a very detailed inspection. You need to open up the panels, not unlike what you would do with a 100-hour inspection. 
maybe not quite that detailed, but you need to take a look at the things that are going to get you in trouble. Like you just said, Greg, birds uh, nest that are way inside, or the bugs or the bees that get deep inside, because that's safety for them. They're away from where their enemies can get a hold of them. So they like to be bored down in something that they feel like they protect themselves. But those are also the same places where they can cause us a lot of grief in airplanes. So it's not just willy-nilly that that you park the airplane and, oh, yeah, I've parked it for a month at a time. It's no worry. I'll leave it for two months or three months. It's not that simple. You bring up a good point, John, and you used a couple of key words I want to talk about. And Jason, definitely jump in on this. One is grease. The fact that long, you know, for sitting long periods of time without movement, of course, you don't spread the grease. But two, it grease dries out. Grease gets dirty from, you know, just accumulation, especially wherever that grease may be in the in possibly in the fuselage. You know, if you got the airplane parked outside, the wind is blowing, dust accumulates, things like that. Is there anything we need to be doing to check the grease? And then the second part of that is we have two different really styles of avionics and instruments in airplanes. Of course we have the old analog, what we call steam gauge engines, where you have round dials, you have bellows you have those types of instruments that work off of pedostatic pressure and things like that and then of course we have modern day avionics everything is ones and zeros a bunch of electrons moving to make a pretty picture in that airplane are there anything that pilots need to do to ensure that those different types of of avionics and instruments are up to snuff after sitting for long periods of time as well. My big concern is, of course, bugs and even, you know, mice and that kind of stuff getting in and eating the wiring or at least eating the the insulation off the wiring. Well, that is very common on airplanes that are stored. Many people don't realize that, that little critters will get in there and then they get hungry and they'll eat the insulation off your wiring. But as far as the, the, the avionics in radio gear on the airplane, that is also a big concern. And you mentioned years ago about the early uh, steam gauge type airplanes. Well, those are all very susceptible to moisture and corrosion caused by that moisture inside. You know, I, I once took an airplane many years ago out to the desert, and it was going to be parked for an extensive period of time. I also, by f- misfortune, I think, went out and recovered that airplane a year later was amazed at the number of, of electronic components that didn't work when we powered the airplane up, but they worked fine when we brought it in there. So, you know, airplanes don't like to be sit on the ground for extended periods of time, and that includes all the avionics and, and electrical components in the airplane. You know, even though we have transistors and that are sealed inside components, there's still connections between that components and wherever they're going to, the information is going to. And those connections are subject to corrosion and uh, and also other problems, contamination. So it it is a concern. You need to be looking at all this stuff. There is actually chemicals. If you have quick disconnects, there's actually chemicals you can spray on those connections for extended storage. But uh, most people don't do that because it's rather labor-intensive. So they just park them, and then they feel like they'll deal with them when they put the airplane back into service. So I don't know which school of thought is the better of the two, but the school of thought that is the best of the two is you make sure you check everything out in the airplane when you bring it back after it's been stored for an extensive period of time. And that the lecture may seem routine to Greg because I just gave him one about flying that airplane that he just bought after it sat for so long. Before he goes flying it across the country, he better be flying it around the area that he is where there's plenty of airports to put it down. Absolutely, yeah. And, Greg, one of the things, just kind of back up on another subject, yet yeah, avionics are very important, and we've seen that. And you can see the degradation and, and wear and things that happens just, you know, from heat. There's a difference between an airplane sitting in the humidity in the southeast and an airplane that's sitting out in the sun in Arizona. So that there's different kinds of wear. But back to the back to your question about you were talking about the cables and we were talking about the grease and stuff, John. You know, one of the things that we see is, you know, it's really important when you're putting your airplane up for long periods of time that you know that you have the control locks in. I, I know how simple this sounds, but sometimes you'll go out to an airport and you'll see the wind blowing and control surfaces are moving and nobody put the rudder gust, nobody put the gust locks in and or put any sort of locks on the ailerons and flaps and whatnot. And so w- when you have these long periods of time and you don't do that and 
the components are lubricated and they're greased and the dust gets in there. The dust gets on the hinges and the surfaces are moving. There's, there's a lot of wear that occurs there. A lot of wear that occurs at the hinges, the brackets, the attach points, the, uh, the rod arms, the exposed cables, the cable ends, all that stuff is exposed, is exposed to a lot of wear. So, you know, coming back from a long extended period of time of sitting, you really safety in mind, you have to be very vigilant. It, it's, it's a really thorough, um, extremely extensive, pre-flight inspection, walk around, or to, to go as far as having your mechanic come back out, walk around with you if it's a long period of time, just to make sure that you feel safe with everything, because things do have a tendency while it's sitting all by itself to wear out and break. It just, it, it happens. It's amazing how that stuff happens. No use and it breaks. You use it a lot and it doesn't. Absolutely, John. I was just looking at a, I was just looking at a really big airplane recently. I was looking at a De Havilland Caribou that I was that I'm interested in, and uh, I was up taking a look at the the elevators. The airplane's been sitting for a very long time. I went up to have a look, and just so happened that the attach points for the elevator attach arm, if you will, that, that goes to the control surfaces, both top and bottom are cracked. They weren't cracked; they were brand new when they were put on right before it flew last. But they're cracked today. So, you know, and it hasn't flown anywhere. It's just been sitting on the ground. So it's just from the wind. So, you know, those kinds of things happen and people need to be vigilant to make sure that they, they can check and make sure that any small things like that get caught before the next flight. Yeah, well, I've, I've been around enough pilots that believe if it flew in, it will flew out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> The other thing that always concerns me, especially uh, about airplanes that are sitting in high humidity environments, is the fact that some of the hangar rash, because paint is deteriorated and things like that, next thing you know, you have corrosion starting. So if the airplane has been sitting for a month or so, that is sufficient time for the start of corrosion to occur. And a lot of people look for the obvious, kind of like looking at your barbecue and you see, ah, oh, there's some rust on the on the handle or whatever. Looking at an airplane and looking for corrosion is substantially different because the corrosion will start under the paint. And, you know, the telltale signs, of course, are, are bubbling of the paint or cracking of the paint. Are there things that pilots should be looking at or places that they should be uniquely concerned about to look for the start of corrosion? My experience is corrosion can start anywhere. So naturally, you would look, look for the seams on the skin, seams from the skin, around the rivet holes, but it can start anywhere. And once you get a corrosion pit anywhere on a piece of metal, that's a spot that's most likely going to have a crack. Uh, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it is going to crack. Corrosion pits seem to grow cracks right out of them. It really needs to be watched very carefully. And most people don't recognize that. And they don't recognize the fact that if you, if you have an all-metal airplane, the, metal, the skin of the airplane is actually uh, the structure of the airplane. So you, you have to be very concerned about corrosion and corrosion pitting because you can compromise the whole panel with corrosion pitting in the, in the wrong spot or the right spot, depending on your point of view. So you really need to, to pay attention. You know, airplanes, the airplanes are a wonderful machine, but they do need a lot of TLC. And I see more and more pilots today that don't have the TLC mindset. They just think that they can come out and, like you said, Greg, you know, light the fire and be gone. It's more to it than that, more to it. And because we get away with it so much, they think that's normal. And then, you know, what happens with normal? Then you push the normal, which was already pushing where you should have been. And before long, you end up being a burn spot in the ground someplace. Jason, are there any unique things up in Alaska that kind of differentiate airplanes and, and that kind of thing up there than anything down in the lower 48? Or is it is it basically one and the same? I know, you know, you have bigger critters that get into airplanes up there. <laughs> I've, seen the, I've seen the picture of the bears tearing up the airplanes and everything else. So. Yeah, our, our critters are just a little bit bigger, just just a little bit. But you know, one of the things you know, a majority of our, a vast majority of our flying, Greg, is uh, you know off field. Uh, there is not, you know, we're, we don't have four thousand, five thousand foot paved runways every twenty miles. You're landing on, you know, graded tundra that you hope has some gravel in it so there's some consistency so when it rains the whole week right before you got there there's not a two foot wide drainage ditch right in the middle of the runway that you're going to run into when you land 
So a, a lot of what we do is off field. So the, the airplanes take a different type of service life here than they do in other places because a vast majority of it is off field gravel strips gravel bars middle of a river uh you know those kinds of things there there are some when you get to the bigger cities fairbanks anchorage area south down on the kenai there are airports that you can go into that are paved asphalt if you will but uh, a vast majority of it is is off field so you're looking for a lot of different things you know you're looking for that wear those skin wrinkles the empennage you know is there any is there any wrinkles between the empennage and you know and the main fuselage seams you know buckling at rivet heads along that you know there's there's a lot of other things that you're you're looking for in addition to corrosion just as normal wear here that normally you wouldn't see in the in the lower 48 states when you're flying airport to airport Run, asphalt runway to asphalt runway. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed that years ago when I had one of my airplanes parked in an old T hanger and that kind of stuff with open rafters, you know, it, no matter how clean I tried to keep the airplane, I'd have birds pooping on the airplane all the time. And I've, uh, I've gone out to the airport. I've seen airplanes that have been sitting for a long time, a lot of bird poop and that kind of stuff. How corrosive is that? And is that something that needs, uh, you know, at least attention? Other than the fact of aesthetics, it looks like hell. But, you know, is there anything that, uh, that an owner should be concerned about as far as, uh, you know, the corrosive nature of some of that bird poop? It can be corrosive. It depends on the bird. It depends what the bird has been eating. Uh, it, so... If you have an airplane that's covered, after you clean it off, you need to take a good look at it, especially if it's been sitting for an extended period of time covered. But for the most part, it'll be okay. But there are some remains that, that can have the right amount of, of acidity in them to cause you problems. Absolutely. And then one of the other things I've noticed, uh, Jason, when you and I were out, working on an airplane a couple of about what six weeks ago or thereabouts we had an opportunity to walk around an airport in georgia where we were working and there were some nice airplanes that it's obvious they've been parked for a long time and the biggest problem of course was the fact that all of those plexiglass windows were crazed or clouded what is a recommendation or what should pilots do to try and prevent that from occurring as well or i should say owners to do to their aircraft to prevent that from happening to their particular types of windshields because there is glass uh, of course there's plexiglass and then there's just thin sheets of uh, plastic or plexiglass yeah there's all different kinds of materials to use from regular glass all the way up to different thicknesses of plexiglass and stcs and and heavier duty windows and there's all kinds of uh, windows out there but the easiest thing for an owner to do is to just get a cover if they can get a cover that goes over the windshields whether it's a uh, you know high wing or low wing covers will really really help with that and most of those covers have different barriers in them silver linings for uv light penetration and things like that that'll really help but in the event they leave it out for a long period of time, you do get that crazing. Again, there's different materials that you can get out there. There's different polishes and compounds. You're going to have to hire a mechanic. It's going to take a while. It's labor-intensive, and it's slow. But there is a way to recondition windows that you know don't have wide-opening, gaping, crazed cracks in it that you could stick a pick in. Once you get to that, you probably should reevaluate the removal and replacement. But if it's not like that and it's it's just fogged and mirrored on the outside with light grazing, you can polish those those uh, those plexiglass different thickness plexiglass windows. You can polish those back to clear. Uh, it does take a while, but there's there's a way to do that. But the easiest thing to do and the cheapest thing to do is to buy cover. And then one of the other things that is often forgotten on aircraft, kind of like on automobiles or vehicles that are parked for a long time, the tires. Given the fact that they're exposed to a lot of UV rays from the sun and that kind of stuff, is there any kind of protectant? Do you spray the tires with something? Do you cover the tires? What do you do to preserve those tires? Because, again, you walk around any general aviation airport, you can tell the age of an aircraft, not necessarily looking at the airplane, but if you look at the tires, you know how long it's been sitting. Yeah, no question about that. <laughs> I'll let you take that one, John, but that's a good that's a good discussion point. Yeah, we could spend a lot of time on that. There are chemicals that you can rub onto your tire and help preserve them. But basically, the best thing you can do for your tires is cover them. 
entirely from the top to the bottom. They should be covered to keep the sun away from them. And that's not only direct sun, it can be reflected sun as well. But you need to keep them out of the sun. They will crack very quickly. You know, only a matter of months they'll crack up if they're in direct sun. I've seen so many airplanes out in in, uh, the deserts, airline airplanes that have been parked. In fact, I saw a 747-400 that was parked only a couple of months, and the airplane was pretty well going to be broken up for parts because just to try to correct all the problems that that occurred because nobody took any precautions to uh, protect the airplane. And the tires were, were cooked. The rubber was like cement. So it, uh, well, you need to cover them. Yeah, I think the lesson uh, lesson learned, well, there's been a lot of lessons in this discussion, but I think the big thing is, you know, you have the rubber tires, of course, you know, gaskets and seals, they dry out as well. They have to stay lubricated. They have to, uh, you know, the engine or any kind of component part that has any kind of seal, you know, needs to be well preserved. And, and these are the kinds of things. It's the little things. And the three of us being accident investigators, the majority of the time we go out and look at an aircraft that has crashed or been involved in some sort of serious event where we see a component part, you know, malfunction or failure, a lot of it, a lot of the time it's either been neglected, abused over its service life limit and things like that. It's not the big things. It's the little things that cause these mechanical malfunctions and failures. It's not like the wings falling off. Yes, we do have airplanes that had wings come off and that kind of stuff. But those are extremely rare events. But the abnormality, the abnormal operation, the failure of a a part or a component, those happen all the time. And we see it in some form. And whether it has caused or contributed in an accident is here nor there. A lot of times we've been out, we found the cause of the accident to be totally unrelated to some of the other findings. So it is very important that if you are going to leave an aircraft park for some period of time, and again, these are big investments. This is not like going out and buying a $1,200 car and just letting it sit outside. Yeah, whatever happens, happens. I mean, these you're investing a lot into these machines. And like you said, John, you're putting your life in this machine. Last thing you want is this machine to fail you at a very inopportune time. It behooves you as a pilot and then slash owner to to do whatever it takes to uh, preserve that aircraft because that aircraft is going to preserve your life more or less. I know that we've had a great discussion. I always appreciate you coming on, Jason, and bringing insight. And as I told you before, now that you're on, we're, we're going to be calling you. You're, you have no choice. You can, you can run, but you can't hide because we know how to track you down because we are the flight safety detective. So we, we will find you. <laughs> you guys can give me a call. Anytime you want to give me a call, feel free to give me a buzz. Nav exterior line. Control. Engine start panel. Well, hello, everybody. We're back again for another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. So today I have joining us Ken McTiernan, who is an airline mechanic, who also is the uh, board member of PAMA, and also runs the Aerospace Maintenance Skills Competition. He's the actual person who physically puts on the show and responsible for coordinating everything and uh, making it happen. And I can tell you that uh, I've been with him for five years now, and he does a phenomenal job. So welcome, Ken. Hi, John. Hi, Greg. Great to be here. Okay. So given that rosy introduction, what is this going to take? What does your airline require you to do if you're going to put an airplane down for a day, a week, a month, a year? And start with the shorter term first, if we will. Okay. Well, when an airline decides to park an aircraft, um, it's not an easy decision. There's no crystal ball, really, to figure out how long an aircraft needs to be parked or put down for storage. Most people may not realize that you can actually just park an aircraft from anywhere from 48 hours to a week, which is the terminology. Anything over a week, you're looking at the term of storage. And storage could be short-term, 
long term, and some airlines may even have intermediate storage. Well, wow. so do they differentiate between the airframe and the engine during the storage period? Uh, pretty much uh, each airline may have a more detailed process compared to another airline, it's just in the way that they will do things. But by and large, the airframes have the same criteria for when they're put into storage or parking, and the same goes for engines and APUs. When you park an aircraft or store an aircraft, different things are done to the engines than they are done to the airframes. And do you have any feel for typically how long it would take to prepare an airplane for like a seven-day rest? Well, a seven-day rest or parking an aircraft for up to a, a week really isn't labor-intensive. By and large, you're just going to do a walk around of the aircraft, make sure it's clean, no leaks, and you're going to install covers on the inlets and the exhaust and just do a general visual inspection maybe every couple of days. So as as a, a rule of thumb, a mechanic would go out to the airplane and do a, uh, essentially a walk around and look and make sure nothing has changed? That is correct. Okay, and now what about something more than a week? Well, that's where it gets a little bit more intensive. For We'll use the engines as an example. Uh, when you store an engine on wing for, say, a month before you start any of the process, you're going to need to idle the engines for about 15 minutes. Then you need to look at the IDG air and oil cooler, make sure they're clean, make sure there's no corrosion, your variable bleed valves, uh, make sure that you install a vapor barrier film over the grills, and then you're going to put inlet and exhaust covers again on your engine, and you'll put desiccant bags and humidity indicators. Then you'll waterproof the engine basically by putting a waterproof cover over the engine, pretty much like you're going to cocoon it. Over the whole engine, the cowling and everything, not just the... Over the whole thing, from the strut all the way around it. So you essentially plastic bag it or some sort of a bag? Pretty much. And are the engine covers and exhaust covers installed at this time as well? Yes, they are. So a full cocoon, all right, on both engines. What else is done? What's done to the airplane? Well, then the airplane, again, depending on the length, either short-term or long-term, not much is done to a short-term storage. But if you decide to go to a short-term storage and then it turns into a longer time frame, that's okay. Because before you do any long-term storage, there are other steps you need to take that are included in the short-term storage. So you have to do one to get to the other. So you don't have to take it all apart and run the engine again and then uh, start from square one? That is correct. When you're going to storage, you have to uh, make sure that the airplane is ready to be stored because if there's any damage to the airplanes or any leaks, you're going to want to take care of that first. If there are airworthiness directives and calendar controlled items, you can actually defer that type of work when you put an airplane in the storage. However, whenever you pull that airplane back out of storage and ready to put it into revenue service, you have to accomplish any of that deferred maintenance that you did to that particular aircraft. Does it have to be completed? It has to be completed before it goes into revenue. Some airlines may like to do the ADs while it is in storage, kind of catch up on time-sensitive issues so when it's ready to go back into service, it can go into service quicker. What else in the airplane? What about covering uh, any openings like computer static ports? and The very basic steps you'll do for an aircraft, and this goes back to the parking and short-term terminology is you'll cover all your PDOT and static ports with covers. You'll cover your tires. You'll make sure the aircraft are chalked, the brakes are off, 
your engine covers and exhausts are installed. The same with the exhaust for the APU. And as time goes on, put desiccant bags throughout the aircraft. You'll open up cabin doors. And it, throughout the time frame, you'll also go out and open and close the cargo doors and the entry doors to make sure that they continue to work. Okay, so let's, we have it closed up, and we talked about a week, and then we talked about longer. What if you know that you're going to have it down for six months or a year? Is there additional steps that have to be taken? There are a little bit more additional steps, but it basically it's progressive. So everything that you needed to do from a week to a month to two months to three months to six months, that all needs to be accomplished prior to the one-year threshold anything over a year it's it's pretty rare that you're going to store an aircraft for that long but if you're going to go up to a year some of the steps that you'll have to do is drain the oil and replenish it with a preservative oil and that's for the apu and the engines you'll drain the fuel supply lines making sure the spar valve is closed and getting preservative fluid through the hmu on a cfm by dry motoring it, and then when you're done dry motoring it, then you're going to wet motor the engine until you get some spray out of the exhaust to make sure the preservative fluids go throughout the engine. Engine's pretty expensive. You want to make sure it's ready to be put to bed the right way. All right. For the benefit of uh, listeners that don't know what an HMU unit is, can you explain that? Uh, yes. HMU on a CFM, it's... Hydromechanical unit, it's just a fancy term for the fuel control. It's pretty much a square-shaped box on the engine that is going to meter the amount of fuel required at different power settings. And it's a very expensive part on the engine, and that's why you want to make sure that you're going to put the correct preservative fluid through it so your engine is ready to go when you're ready to put it back in service. Okay. Now, are there any requirements that anywhere along the way to, to uh, go back out and to start an engine, like the one that's been put down for a week or, or a month? Yes. Uh, an airplane that you need to run your engines, it's also something called an alternative method, where when I just mentioned about running preservative fluid through your engines for fuel and oil, if you don't want to do that, or if an airline doesn't want to do that, and they are able to park an aircraft in a location where they can run the engine or well, once every 30 days they just go out and run the engines at idle for roughly 15 20 minutes and then shut the engine down and that will take the place of having to do the heavier maintenance of draining and resurfacing the oil and the fuel so essentially you're just running fresh fuel through the uh, fuel control and and uh, through the engine nozzles to keep anything from clogging up Correct, and lubricated as well. Yes, most people don't realize that jet fuel, Jet 1A, is actually a lubricant as well as a fuel that burns in the airplane. So it does have a, have a lubrication qualities. What about unpickling the airplanes that have been down for a month or three months or six months? Well, the unpickling is pretty straightforward. Each manufacturer will call out for a certain system to have an operational check and it's generally referred to as a ground check so you want to make sure everything is working you'll go out you'll raise and lower the flaps you'll uh, reinstall batteries that you had removed from the emergency equipment you'll reactivate emergency exits the slides again depending on the manufacturer other systems that you'll have to make sure are working, the oxygen system, and that's all called out in what we call work cards. All right, so work cards, task documents, tell the mechanic what to do and in what order he should do it in. Correct, and it's also a good documentation that is specific to each aircraft that a respective airline has stored or parked. Some airplanes are parked or stored for three months, Compared to other aircraft that are stored longer, more work will be required on the longer stored aircraft. And it's a good way of making sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. 
Any idea how many man hours it takes to put an airplane down for a month or longer storage? Well, again, it depends on each airline, but the man hours for each duration of storage would range anywhere from 60 to 100 man hours. Wow, it's not not a, a simple task. No, it's a lot of people may not stop to think about what it takes to make sure this process is done correctly. Some airlines may want to just gamble and park an airplane and not do everything that they are required to due to insurance programs that they have on their aircraft. You know, what does the leaser want compared to what you have on your own airplane that you own outright? You know, interesting, an airline like Delta, I've read where they have put 600 airplanes into storage. And in fact, I saw some of those in Birmingham not long ago all lined up. The amount of work from what you're describing is significant for a fleet that size. Yes, it's funny how an aircraft needs uh, what I like to say 24-7 care. When the aircraft are operating, the airplane comes into an airport, uh, passengers aren't quite aware that Technicians are doing walk-arounds and taking care of discrepancies that are found by the flight crew or the ramp personnel. And when an airplane goes into storage, we don't stop doing our job. We have to make sure that the aircraft remains in airworthy condition, even if it's not being used. So people see pictures of airplanes that are lined what seems like for miles, wingtip to wingtip. Something just as simple as parking an aircraft you have to plan that out because like we mentioned, if you're just going to run your engine for 15 to 20 minutes, once a month, you're not going to park your airplanes nose to tail because you have to have more room to do that. Whereas if you park your aircraft relatively wingtip to wingtip, of course, with space between the wingtips, you can raise and lower your flaps. You can run your APUs. You can run your engines and you can do the maintenance that needs to be done with a better eye toward safety for the technicians doing the work. I can remember back after 9-11, you know, not a day after it, months after it, maybe five months after it, and I was out to uh, Victorville where a lot of uh, U.S. carriers had parked some airplanes. And there was one 747, and that was a 400, which was a fairly new airplane. And the airline had flown it in there and parked it. It belonged to a bank. And all the airline did was bring it in because they were returning it. They flew the airplane in. The crew got off and got in a rent a car, and they were gone. And the airplane was just parked there. They did nothing to it. So when I got to see it four or five months after that had happened, essentially when I was uh, going around with the people that ran the facility, we came to that airplane, and and I said, well, that's an almost new airplane. They said, yeah, but it's scrap now because they dropped the airplane in. The engines had been running whichever way they wind blew. All four engines were windmilling, whether it was backwards, turning backwards or forwards. Of course, forwards, you're getting oil pump pressures in there, so it's not as detrimental as running it in reverse for four months. I looked at the tires. I, we got out and walked around the airplane. I looked at the tires where the sun had hit them. The tires were, were junk. They were gone all the tires. So here we got engines that are going to have to go through a shop visit, which is not a cheap adventure. You got, you're got you going to have to re- probably replace every tire on the airplane, and God knows what else is wrong with the airplane. Now, if we really turn the clock back, when I was turning wrenches years ago, we took some airplanes out of the desert, and they weren't there that long. But we took them out, and man, the problems that we had to fix. You know, everybody who comes up with the, the little... Uh, bugs that get into the pedostatic system and so on and so on. And yes, we had plenty of problems with those. But there was other electronic equipment that just doesn't like to be sitting around doing nothing. And we were changing gyros and and, uh, some black boxes and instruments when they weren't operated, but all of a sudden they were good when the airplane went in, and now they're no good when it's time to take the airplane out. So it's amazing what happens to airplanes in conditions like that. Yes, I don't think people uh, realize that just the UV damage that can be done from an aircraft sitting out, it's almost like someone's car that sits in a lot for an extended period of time. Your paint starts to fade, your windows 
have damage. So windows have to be covered both on the outside and then on the inside. And that's not just the cockpit windows, but that's also all the passenger windows. And that eats up a lot of time for a technician to go from window to window to make sure they're properly covered. And then if the airplane sits long enough, like you pointed out, Mother Nature has a way of showing herself. Birds will nest, bees will create hives, wasps. So there really is a lot into maintaining an aircraft that isn't operating. Yeah, people don't realize what the when you have the landing gear lowered, which is what we have on the ground, that there's nice big holes in there for critters to get up and to make a nest protection from from a, a lot of the the other animals that uh, have an impact on those critters. They're usually the smaller critters. Yes, and the smaller, uh, the more damage. If you get mice up on your airplane, you're looking at a big potential for damage because they can get in, nest, uh, start chewing on wires, and you're not going to know what wire they're eating on until you're ready to put that airplane back into service. That's right. People, you know, when, a, when you get little critters like mice on the airplane and they run out of food, like human beings, they'll eat almost anything. And they do eat their way through wires. I've had experience with that myself. And what's really a challenge is finding out where they ate through them because they can go and all throughout the airplane where you don't even have the ability to look in, never mind to get in there to fix it. And I know in some cases we actually it was easier to run additional wires through the wire bundles than it was to go looking for where the, the problem was. So it leads to uh, some interesting times. Well, I think we covered uh, both sides putting it down for maintenance, and then taking it back out of maintenance. So, Ken, I would thank you for your time and a very good explanation. I hope that this all works out for the airlines. I'm very concerned about all the employees, you know, with United saying that, uh, telling everybody that come September when the guarantees are off from the money that they took from the federal government to expect uh, an adjustment in the personnel, which means layoffs. I don't know why they're afraid to say the word, but they uh, they didn't want to say it. But all the airlines are going to be pretty much in the same boat, reduction in, in staff. You know, maybe some of them will give uh, early outs to a lot of their employees, which will help save some of the younger guys with families. But we'll have to wait and see what they do. The airlines are certainly going to be a little thinner and leaner. This is a good opportunity to, to park the old gas guzzlers. The newer technology airplanes, once they start coming back into service, as an example with the 737 MAX, it'll benefit the airline. I hope they do offer early out packages to minimize any reduction in the workforce. And for the students that are in school getting ready to come into the airlines, please don't be dismayed on what's happening. We're always going to need new talent coming in the door. Amen. We do need a young blood. I know for a fact that one major airline, that the average age on that airline had just made 68 years old. So imagine that. Half of the employees are over 60, I mean 58 years old. That's a lot of talent and skill that needs to be passed on to the next generation coming in the door. Yes. I can remember years ago when one of the presidents of an airline, when I was still with the NTSB, it was uh, before 9-11. And this airline had gotten a, a sizable fine from the FAA for maintenance work. He was chiding me because someone in the organization had convinced him to offer the early out to mechanics. He had offered the early out to other groups within the airline, and he offered it to mechanics, and a lot of the senior people took it. And with them went the corporate knowledge, the experience on how to comply with the regulations. Because people, most people don't realize that Sometimes the uh, instructions from the manufacturer and from engineering departments on how to maintain airplanes are not the clearest, although it has gotten better in the last uh, bunch of years. But back 20 years ago, there was a lot of airplanes that the maintenance manuals were difficult to understand. I'll be kind. Difficult to understand. And it took an old hand to understand them that had been around for a while and went through the grief of trying to comply with a manual that wasn't clear. They understood it by that point in time. And then virtually overnight, they went out the door. And this particular airline overnight started having problems with the FAA with compliance issues. So it's uh, an interesting uh, field of endeavor that we have put ourselves into. 
Very true. Very true, John. Well, thank you, John and Greg. I really enjoyed being on the show. And we enjoyed having you, and uh, we will put you on the list for uh, future subjects as well. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, we hope that this has been informative. Uh, We always encourage your feedback, your questions, and and that kind of thing. Uh, We try to address that with guests and uh, in the discussions between myself and John. So you can always contact us at our email, which is flight safety detectives with an S at gmail.com. Again, we always appreciate that. Please give us a, a rating through your podcast provider. We always appreciate those high ratings. We're still looking for sponsors and donors and and that kind of stuff to keep our show going. And we try to provide as much informative information, up-to-date, current, and things that uh, you don't normally hear about in the mainstream media and even through some of the uh, talking heads as well. But the fact is, is that we try to make this educational and we always appreciate your insight and your opinions and your questions to help us improve that education. So with that being said, John, I will sign us off once again. uh, I can't wait to get back in the studio to see your shining face rather than looking at it through my computer screen occasionally. So uh, we, we know that that'll happen soon and I'm expecting that to happen hopefully before you and I get a year older. So uh, it's, uh, it's always good to have these kinds of discussions, and, and I enjoy it. This has been uh, basically the highlight of the stay-at-home part of this coronavirus stand-down, if you will. So, again, thanks as always, and uh, I look forward to seeing you. And with that, I will tell all of our audience, when it does happen, fly safe. To listen to more episodes of the show, go to flightsafetydetectives.com or the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association at PAMA.org and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Catch us next time when John Golia and Greg Fife talk about all things aviation. Thanks for listening.